Hello and welcome to video lecture of uh, chapter 13. Uh, before I begin this lecture, I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, the what's going on in the course right now. Uh, as you may know, uh, the chapter 13 is going to be the last chapter that we will cover this semester. Uh, typically, I cover also chapter 15, uh, oscillations, but I don't think we'll have the time to do that. So that's going to be the, uh, the last chapter of gravitation. Your book calls it Newton's Theory of Gravity, same thing. Uh, anyway, before I begin on the chapter, uh, just a little update on the final exam. I have added another uh, section here under Module 6, if you go to the course under Canvas. And uh, I have added the, or posted rather, the topics that you need to study for the final exam. Let me go through them very quickly. Oh, and by the way, before I forget, the final exam, I am just going to do it, uh, going to make it as... Um, you know, the final exam schedule before the online transition, which, uh, uh, you know, the online, the, excuse me, the exams begin on May 11th and do, um, they finish around May 13th. So I am going to open the exam on May 11th, which is a Monday, May 11th right there. So that's a Monday. So the exam is going to open on a Monday and it's going to close on Wednesday. Okay. And that's going to be all under mastering physics. Okay, uh, and uh, the topics on that exam, and by the way, it's going to finish, uh, the the, uh, uh, the exam due date is uh, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 11.59 p.m., okay, uh, and the topics that you need to study are listed right here, uh, chapter 2, kinematics, projectile motion, free fall, and then those sections, anyway, please take the time to read them, if you have any questions, let me know. But these are the topics that you need to do. Uh, we haven't been tested on uh, chapter 12 and 13. So there will be some questions on those, of course, in the final exam. Okay. Uh, in addition to the quiz that you're going to be having for chapter 13. Okay. All right. I, I, I may give you some more details on the final exam uh, later during the, uh, the, the coming week. Okay, so uh, let's talk about uh, this chapter. Um, it's a fun chapter, I think. The subject is uh, is very interesting, and it's not terribly long, so uh, I think I'll manage to cover it all in uh, hopefully below an hour. But that's, uh, I mean, I plan to do at least two, three problems from the from the book and uh, several problems from the examples. the The chapter has really good examples. So, like usual, please uh, stop the video and read the entire chapter. I am covering pretty much over almost 90% of the chapter. So, please make sure that you have read all the chapter before you watch this video, because I'm not going to be talking about everything, okay? Um, so, uh, the study of gravitation, uh, it didn't begin really with Isaac Newton. It really began with um, uh, Kepler, Johann Kepler. And uh, I believe that was in the um, uh, roughly in the uh, uh, late 16th century. Uh, uh, during that time, Kepler was a student of um, uh, the famous astronomer Tycho Brahe. And then uh, what he did, he collected, uh, Tycho Brahe collected a lot of astronomical data from previous astronomers. And then uh, his student, uh, Johann Kepler, uh, took all these uh, data, and this is, remember that, this was uh, almost 100 years before the birth of Isaac Newton, which means before the invention of calculus, and uh, he took all the data, and using the basic laws of um, algebra, geometry, and trigonometry, and he was able to uh, come up with the famous three laws of Kepler. Uh, I want to show them to you here. Uh, of course, they are shown in the book, first page. Uh, let me show them. I'll just read them for you. I'm trying to find them. Should be here. There they are, right here. Uh, Kepler's laws, the three laws. I urge you to memorize them or just to be familiar with them without looking at the book. Uh, the first law uh, says the planet or the Earth. He actually said the Earth, not the planet. He said the Earth moves around the sun in an elliptical orbit. Okay, nobody knew that. Okay, that was big news for everybody back then. Uh, I mean, people they had the uh, the uh, um, the geocentric model where the entire universe goes around the Earth, and we are at the center of the universe. 
Now he's saying that the Earth goes around the Sun in an elliptical orbit, with even more detail. Not circular, it's actually elliptical. And then uh, the second line, it says the line between the Sun and the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal time intervals. It's called the law of areas. The, uh, the Sun sweeps equal areas in equal time. It's basically the Later on, Newton came out, uh, 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 Newton's idea of the conservation of angular momentum. This is really an old statement of the conservation of angular momentum. And then the third one is more of a mathematical law. It says that the, the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the radius. Okay. He said the square of a planet's orbital period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. I'm going to derive this law for you in this lecture, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so these are the three laws of Kepler, and then fast forward maybe a hundred years or so. Um, here, it says Kepler published the first work in 1609, and then of course came after that Galileo, and then after that uh, came Isaac Newton. Uh, and then of course Newton came up with the famous laws of... Uh, you know, the gravitational law that you probably a lot of you are familiar with, trying to find it. And I'm going to begin my lecture from Newton's Laws, once I find it. There it is right here. So if you have basically said, if you have two masses, M2 and M1, and they are separated by a distance R, remember that distance is always between the two centers, right? Between the center of M1 and the center of M2. Then there is a gravitational pull between them. There is a tendency for them to come together and and, and, and be attracted to each other, that force is equal to here, that force is equal to the product of the two masses, m1 times m2, divided by the square of their distance, okay, r squared, up to a constant, we call it the universal gravitational constant, big G, okay? Don't confuse it with small g, 9.8. This is a universal gravitational constant, and the value of it is this number, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, okay? Uh, and of course, that force, you know, because Newton's third law for every action, there is a reaction, so the force on M2 due to M1 or the force on M1 due to M2 basically are equal. That's what he's saying here, okay? All right, and um, and then of course, it's an, sorry, it's an in inverse square law, which means it's one over R squared. In other words, as the two masses go further and further away from each other, the gravitational force of this, this gravitational pull, it, it drops down, okay, it decreases. How, what's the rate of the decrease? Is 1 over r squared. You got that? Okay. And that would be a graph of it, how it looks like, how it drops down. Uh, and then he talks about the difference between weight and mass. I'll talk about it in a second. Okay, let me let me begin my lecture. All right. Uh, so Newton's law says F equals G M one M two over R squared. What that means, I have two masses, one and two. Call it M one, M two, and they are there is a distance between them between their center, make sure that you say the center uh, between them, so there will be a, a gravitational pull, or a, a pull between them, FF I'm going to call them, and this F, they're both equal, just opposite, opposite direction, uh, is equal to G M1 M2 over R squared. Very simple, okay? Now imagine the following, here is Earth, I mean imagine that uh, as you are right now on Earth, here is Earth. Try to make it a circle. Okay, and let's say you are right now sitting on your desk while watching um, this video. So here you are right here, okay? Or should I make it a, a person? Eh, make it a block. Of course, you are uh, this much this uh, far away from the center of the Earth, right? Okay. Okay. Um, so compare those two pictures together, okay? So here you have two masses, your mass, M1, and you get the mass of the Earth, and the distance between their centers, or the two centers, is from your center to the center of the Earth, would be that distance, we'll call it R. So in this case, I can calculate the gravitational pull between you and the Earth. Make sense? Kind of makes sense, right? 
I mean the distance here, this the distance between the two centers, right? Now let me let me let me draw that person, uh, uh, you know, make him a real person rather than a block, just because for a good reason. In a minute, let's see. So here is a person, right? So here is the center of mass of that person. Here is the center of the mass of the Earth. So the distance between them is r. Well, r, uh, you know, the radius of the Earth. So hold on. So the uh, the radius of the Earth is r sub Earth. By the way, this this symbol means Earth. I use it a lot. This symbol means Sun, and the circle with nothing in it is Moon. Okay, these are popular symbols among, among astronomers. So, for example, I say the radius of the Sun like that, radius of the Earth, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, you see what I'm saying? Or the distance between the Earth and the Moon, and so on. Okay, so the big R, okay, the big R is the radius. Okay, so big R is ra oops, sorry. Big R is radius, and the small r is distance, okay? Distance between two centers, if you will, okay? That's just my symbolism here, okay? So big R is radius, and small r is the distance. You got that? So here we have this person on Earth right here, and so the distance between them is the radius of the Earth plus plus the uh, let's say the height of the person right there which is this height from the center which is like right there midsection let's make it h you know call it whatever you want right now the radius of the earth is roughly six million okay and the height of the person let's say one meter so this is six million meter that's one meter you agree with me six million plus one meter is basically six million right so for all practical purposes I can say that the distance between the person and the center of the Earth is basically the center of the Earth. Would that be okay? Would that be a good approximation? So let me do that. Look what will happen. Um, whoops, what am I doing? Um, something is wrong here. When I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm touching the screen and I'm out of a sudden my, uh, my hand is, is making those lines. Uh, I think I changed the setting. Let me fix that and I'll be back. Okay, I'm back. I, I paused the video for about uh, 20 minutes trying to figure out how to touch the screen without uh, my hand uh, making, uh, uh, you know, a drawing. See, when I touch it, look at that. Uh, a line is formed. This is, uh, in the past, I'm able to touch it and lift the screen, but now I can't touch it anymore. And I cannot get rid of that. I don't know how to get rid of this feature. Anyway, if you know how, uh, let me know, please, because uh, I don't like it. I would rather use my hand just to lift the screen up. The, the mouse doesn't do a good job. Uh, anyway, so let's continue on what we are doing. So now we are, like I said, we have this person uh, standing uh, on the surface of the Earth, and I want to know the gravitational pull on that person. Let's assume that the mass of the person, let's make them, um, uh, say, 100 kilograms. That's a little heavy for our, any, any person. But anyway, let's just say that for the sake of simplicity. So in this case, the force on the person is equal to G. Uh, mass of that person is 100 times the mass of the Earth, which is roughly 6 times 10 to the power of um, 24. Again, this is just an approximation. Divided by the distance between the person and the center of the Earth, and we said that for it's roughly 6 million. Okay, so that's 6 times 6 to the set, quantity squared, right? And then I want to calculate all that. Remember, G is uh, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. And then I multiply all of that. I'm going to use the calculator. Go ahead and calculate things with me, please. Uh, let's calculate this number. So I have here 100 times um, 6 e24 uh, times 6.67 uh, negative 11 uh, divided by uh, 6.6.0 e6 squared. Answer. I got the answer to be. If I sorry, I'll just. Just take that out and just I, I was able to calculate the whole thing in one shot and the answer is roughly uh, 1111.7 Newton correct well guess what if I would calculate that this actually turns out to be the following 
it's actually equal to mg. See, if I want to calculate mg of this person, so it is 100 times 9.8, okay, and that will be equal to 980. Now, of course, Newton. Now, believe me, those two numbers are actually exactly equal, okay? They only differ, but the reason that they are different, see, this is 1011, which is our about this is 1000. The reason is because I am approximating the uh, radius of the Earth, uh, excuse me, yeah, the radius of the Earth, and I'm approximating here the weight of the Earth. However, if I would put those numbers accurately, it will turn out to be uh, uh, 980. You can test it yourself, by the way. Go back to the table. There is a table, um, uh, I have to use, so table <clears throat> uh, 13.2, page uh, 348, and you can get the accurate value of the uh, mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth, and then you can plug them back into that equation you will get something that is really close to 980, okay? So anyway, in other words, what I'm saying is, what is weight? Remember we said weight is equal to mg. So what, what is weight? Well, weight is the amount of force that you are being pulled by the Earth. Well, that's exactly what's going on here. Well, this guy right here. This person is standing on the, on the surface of the Earth, and he's standing on the surface of the Earth here, and so he is being pulled toward the center of the earth. So that would be basically weight. In other words, this formula right here is nothing but mg as well, m1g for that matter. So in this case, I can say that. See, I have a new definition for g is equal to g is equal to g m over r squared. Let me let me do that. So let me. Uh, so we have here the force is equal to g m m over r for the earth okay for the yeah let's say for the earth squared that's also equal to the weight of an object on the surface of the earth so here is the mass of the objects cancel out so we have a new definition for the value of g which is g big m over the radius of the earth squared you don't believe me let's calculate and see if we get 9.8 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 mass of the earth this time i'm going to give you the accurate number it is 5.98 times 10 to the not terribly accurate but good enough divided by the radius of the earth and that's again from the table it is uh, 6.37 times 10 to the power of 6 quantity squared and let's calculate together and see if we get that 9.8 or hopefully close to it close enough okay so let's do that so we have here 6.67 uh, negative 11 times 5.98 uh, 24 divided by uh, 6.37 6 squared answer I got 9.83 meter per second squared are you convinced now isn't that interesting so basically I can I can find so with this, so this equation is really nothing but weight if it comes when it comes to something standing on the surface of it and the cool thing about it I can actually generalize it what I mean is if I am not on earth but I am say on the moon or Jupiter or the sun any terrestrial object that you want anything any star terrestrial object here is that star, here is that object, okay? And if what is the value, what is the, here is the radius of that object, and here is the mass of that object, whatever it is, even a meteorite, whatever it is, if I want to know the G value of that object, it's nothing but this formula right here. It is basically the gravitational constant G, the mass of that object, mass of the Sun, mass of Jupiter, mass of Saturn, whatever, divided by the radius of that object squared and you will get the value of g for that object for example let's say i want to find what is g on jupiter well i can go i'm not going to do it you you can you can do it i believe it's like around 27 or something if i remember g times the mass of jupiter divided by the radius of jupiter squared 
I can look them up in the table that I just showed you. Let me show it to you on the book. Um, it's on page, uh, uh, I need to locate the section, section six. Let me go to section six. And if you scroll down, you'll see it somewhere here, section six. Oh, there it is, right there. There it is. Okay. So basically here you have a planetary body, including the Sun, Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then you have the average distance to the Sun and the period in days, you know, how long it takes it to complete one, uh, one cycle, one orbit around the Sun. And uh, I guess for the case of the, for the case of the Moon, I think around, yeah, around the Earth here, okay? And, and then you have the mass of that object, and then you get the average radius, okay? So that's table 13.2. Anyway, all right, so back to what we were doing. The next topic um, sorry, yeah, I want to talk about gravitational gravitational potential energy. Uh, your book goes on details on how to derive it. Um, I am not gonna. Uh, I, I'm not gonna give you the details of that. You can look it up on page um, the derivation. You can look it up on page uh, starting from page three four three, and mainly page three forty four. But I'll give you a quick uh, summary how you can get the gravitational potential energy. So we know that the force is equal to g m one m two over r squared. Correct. And if you remember from our previous chapters, we said that the uh, the force is also equal to the negative derivative of the potential energy. Remember that? We talked about that. And we also said that work energy theorem says that work is equal to delta U, the difference in potential. It's also delta K, but that's not important for, for us. And we also said that work is the integral of the force dr or dx, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this force right here, and I'm going to plug it right there, okay? So in this case, I'm going to go g m1 m2 over r squared. I think that is a minus sign here. And then when I integrate it, so basically the g, uh, so I have g m1 m2 out of the integral, and I have, uh, oops, dr here, right? times dr, and then when I integrate that, I need to use the mouse to lift the screen. So in this case, I have minus g m1 m2, and then when, the integral of this one is r, uh, negative 2 plus 1, negative 2 plus 1, and, and then minus g m1 m2, and then we have here over r with a plus sign right there, right? And that's basically the work. What that means, well, we said that work is also equal to the potential energy, so therefore the potential energy is g m1 m2 over r. This is very important result. As a matter of fact, it's actually for a bound orbit, for bound orbit, the potential energy U or delta U is a negative, so it becomes minus G M1 M2 over R. Okay, what does that mean? All right, here is the meaning of it. Let's say, for example, uh, let me just use a, a bigger page. Let's say, for example, you have an object, let's say you have the Earth going around the Sun. Here is the elliptical orbit. Here is the, oops, let me do it again. And let's say here is the Earth right here, and here is the Sun right there, for example. Okay, so this is the Sun, and here is the Earth going around it, okay? So it's going around the Sun. 
Okay, when I ask the question, what is the total energy of the Earth as it goes around the sun? Okay, and the total energy is basically kinetic plus potential. Yes? Makes sense. You know, we've been dealing with that for a long time. The total energy of any system, any mechanical system, is kinetic plus potential. Okay, so that means the kinetic plus potential, which means one half mv squared. Remember, the Earth, the speed of the Earth at, at any point moment here is v, and of course it changes each, uh, you know, uh, depending on how far it is from the sun. But then you have u, which is g m one m two over r. What is m one and m two? Well, it's the Earth and the sun. So if the sun is m two, the Earth is m one, and the distance between them at this moment is r, which is this r right here and you will get the gravitational potential energy. However, we must put a minus sign there if it's a bound orbit, which it is. Why do we do that? Let's show you. See, uh, the total energy, which is K and U, okay, there is a minus sign for bound orbit. Bound orbit means as long as the kinetic energy is less than the potential, okay, the orbit will be, will continue. The, you have a locked orbit or bound orbit. What that means, the Earth, let me put a different color, the Earth is not going to, here the, uh, The Earth here is not going to escape the gravitational pull of the Sun. In other words, it's not going to go around like that and it go shoots out. Why? Why is it not going to escape the gravitational pull of the, the, of the Sun? The reason is because its potential energy is greater than the kinetic energy. So bound orbit or locked orbit is that the potential is greater than the kinetic. This is an important uh, concept in uh, in astronomy and terrestrial mechanics, okay? That's the meaning of a bound orbit. And in in other words, when you subtract the two here, you get a negative value for the energy, I mean the absolute value, and that negative energy is the condition for bound orbit. Okay? So negative total energy is a condition for bound orbit. Now, if it happens that the kinetic energy, for example, let's say you have a, uh, let's say you have the sun, and then you have a rock coming from really far away, and it comes to it, and it goes around it, and then it shoots back to infinity. You know, it's coming from infinity. Okay, it happens all the time, or around uh, Jupiter or something like that. Well, this kind of, it's an orbit, all right. It is also an orbit, but the difference between this one and the bound orbit is that here you have the kinetic energy is greater than the potential energy, and therefore it is unbound. What that means, it will escape. It will escape the gravitational pull. Okay? I am not going to... I mean, your book goes on about that a little bit. Around the end of the chapter, I'll tell you exactly which page... Under, um, I'm trying to find it. Oh, energetic. Yeah, energetics on uh, on page three hundred and fifty. Okay, but that's one one concept. Uh, let me uh, let me move on, and I, I mean maybe I'll let me let me do one example and show you how all that could apply to something. I'm going to do the following three example. Example one, two, and three. Let me do that. <clears throat> Example 13.1. Maybe I'll go to the book and show it to you. 13.1 is on in section 5. Oops, one more. There we go. Okay, it says... 
Uh, these are the kind of problem that you would uh, need to know to do the homework quiz and uh, the final exam. So, uh, you know, pay attention to the to the how I do this with those kind of problem. They're all conservation, it's all based on conservation of energy. And I told you, you uh, it is extremely important that you have to develop a skill for solving problem using conservation of energy. All right. It says here, suppose the Earth suddenly became, it came to a halt, stop, and ceased revolving around the sun. Okay, so Earth stopped for some reason. Uh, the gravitational force would then pull it directly into the sun. What would be the Earth's speed as it crashes into the sun? So there we go. So here we have the Earth here is stopped for some reason. And then now, because of the, it's no longer in a bound orbit, so now it's going to move toward the sun. You know, we just free fall toward the sun. Instead of saying, just like a rock falling toward the Earth. And then, so now it is, so he's asking for what is the speed of the Earth as it crashes at the surface of the sun, okay? So let's calculate that. Uh, let me just get those. Uh, let me make a drawing of it, okay? So initially, what do you got here? Here is the Earth, and here is the sun, okay? Initially. So what's going on is that the speed of the Earth is zero here. And, of course, you get the mass of the Earth, and then you have the mass of the Sun. And the second situation is that the here is the Sun, and here is the Earth just before it crashes into it, okay? God forbid, of course. Okay? And then, so now he's asking for what is the speed of the Earth V? Got it? Okay. So, again, all you need to do is use the conservation of energy u uh, e equal k plus u and generally like i said the, there is always a minus sign maybe i should just write it now uh, always you always put the minus sign there always okay so for when it comes to gravitation but why because the the uh the gra the uh, the potential energy u is always negative because why because gravity by its own nature is attractive there is no repulsion, you know. If there is a, say, a, a, you know, in, in magnetism, you could have north-north pole or south-south pole. Or in electricity, electrostatics, you have positive-positive charge or negative-negative charge. But in gravitation, it's always attractive. There is no such thing as repulsive gravitational pull. So this U is always negative. So you can just put that minus there, indicating this is always a... Gra a, a an attractive gravitational potential. You got that? That's the essence of that minus sign. That's the reason for it. So anyway, so now he says in the first, in the beginning, the Earth comes to a halt, which means that the total energy here basically is what is the gravitational pull between them, which is what? Minus G, mass of the Earth, mass of the Sun, over how far is the Earth from the Sun, which I can look up on the table. That's it. Make sense? Okay. Now we come here. What's going on here? Well, we have the total energy here is K minus U. Okay? So in this case, well, we have a kinetic energy, which is, the this is what I'm looking for, the V. So it's going to be one half of the mass of the Earth, V squared, is that okay? Minus G, the mass of the Earth, mass of the sun divided by how far are they from each other well since the earth is right here and so the distance between them let me take that arrow out just for now the distance between them is really the distance between the two radii the radius of the earth and the radius of the sun you see what i'm saying let me repeat it again the distance between them this dot and this dot it's basically the distance between the two radii, the radius of the sun and the radius of the earth. See the difference between it here? Here you have the total, the distance between the two centers, which is given to you on the table. Table, um, you know, 34, whatever. Okay. Here the distance between the two radii, right? So we write here, the bottom is basically the radius of the earth. Uh, I should make it big R, right? The radius of the earth plus the radius of the sun. You see the difference between the two? Between this one and this? Between this one and this? 
Okay. Now, because of the conservation of energy, those two E's must be equal. So it becomes minus G mass of the Earth, mass of the Sun, divided by Earth, sorry, the distance between the Earth and the Sun equals to uh, one half M mass of the Earth V squared minus G mass of the Earth, mass of the Sun, over the distance between the two radii. And then all we need to do is to solve for to solve for v. That's it. You just do the algebra. You solve for v. I'm not going to do the algebra for you. You can you can do it just because I need to save time to do more problems. So when you work it out, you'll end up with this. Again, the problem is solved in the book. I'm not sure how he did it, but I would assume he would just, he would do it this way. You'll end up with this after some algebra. Two g mass of the sun. Uh, 1 over mass of the Earth plus mass, uh, excuse me, uh, radius of the Earth plus radius of the Sun uh, minus 1 over the distance between the Earth and the Sun uh, to the half. And then you calculate all of that, okay? It's some cal the, the, uh, the, the worst thing about this chapter is a lot of calculations. So make sure you practice it. Uh, a lot of scientific notation you have to uh, put in and so on. Anyway, the velocity becomes 6 times 10 to the 5th meter per second. Okay, and that's basically how it works. You got it? Okay. Now let's do example 13.2. And it has to do with escape velocity. Um, let's read it together. Same section, just... Uh, Here's the table again. You may want to take a screenshot and you know use it, whatever, so rather than coming back to it all the time. Just get a screenshot and put it in your desktop so you can always come back to it. Uh, remember, if you get numbers from the from the internet, uh, they might be a little different from those numbers. You know, each astronomical uh, center, you know, they have the slight differences. So you may get an answer wrong on mastering just because you use the, the different set of data. You see what I'm saying? So I would stick with that because this, these are the numbers that are, uh, you know, set for mastering. And, uh, you know, like I said, just get a screenshot of it and keep it on your desktop. That'll be probably the most convenient thing. Anyway, uh, so here's the example here. Escape speed. I have a 1,000 kilogram rocket. It's fired straight away from the surface of the Earth. Okay. What speed does the rocket need? to escape from the gravitational pull of the Earth, okay? This is a cool problem. I wish I was in class. I would make you a nice demo for you. But basically, here, here is how it works. Let me just talk about it a little bit. Imagine you have a ball, let's say a golf ball, and you throw it straight up, okay? It's going to come back. You grab it again in your hand. You throw it even harder, it's going to go, you know, even higher. So the, the, the harder you throw it upward, the higher it will go, okay? Uh, well, the escape velocity means the following. There is a magic speed for that golf ball where when I throw it, it will just keep going. It will never come back. In other words, it will escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. Okay? And he's asking for, what is this gravitational pull of the Earth for <clears throat> a rocket of 1,000 kilogram, one ton? Okay? So what is that gravitational? Well, let's solve it for any mass m. It will turn out that it's independent of the mass, really. But for any mass m, what is that gravitational pull? Well, remember I talked to you about the uh, bound orbit and unbound orbit? Okay, so the reason when I throw the golf ball up in the air and it comes back, because it is in a bound orbit, in a bound state. It is gravitationally, we, we say, it's gravitationally bound to the Earth. Okay? Now, the moment it escapes, it means that it is no longer bound to the Earth. In other words, what's the condition for a bound orbit? For or uh, The condition is that the, the potential is greater than the kinetic. Remember? Remember, yeah. E equals K minus U, right? And the condition for bound, gravitationally bound, is that the potential is greater than the kinetic. So, when... So, but when the kinetic is greater than the potential, it becomes unbound. It will escape, right? So he said, what is the minimum velocity? This is what he's asking. What is the minimum velocity of escape 
that I could have for that rocket or that golf ball or whatever, okay, where it, it will allow it to escape the, the gravitational pull of the Earth. Well, that's a, that minimum would be when k is equal to u. It should be above that. But when it k equals to u, make sense? In other words, it is one half mv squared equals g mass of the golf ball or whatever, mass of the Earth over uh, over the radius of the Earth. Why the radius of the Earth? Whoops, let me put it a little bit closer. Here is the Earth right here. Here is the radius of the Earth. Here is the rocket. Right? I'm going to shoot it up in the air. So it's going to go up, 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 up. All right? And it's going to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. Okay? So what is the necessary speed? Well, when it is here, uh, the total energy of it is uh, it's basically U. Right? When it is, so in, in order for me to make it escape the gravitational pull of the Earth, I have to give it kinetic energy that is greater than U. Make sense? That's exactly what I've done here. So at the minimum, at the bare minimum, what is that word minimum? So at the minimum, the kinetic is equal to the U. So now, look at this. The mass of the rocket or the Gulf War doesn't really matter. And it turned out that the velocity of escape, look to solve for V here, becomes uh, 2G mass of the Earth over the radius of the Earth under the root. And that's basically the formula. A very famous formula. Here, let me write it down again here. V velocity of escape equal to square root of 2G mass of the Earth over the radius of the Earth. And look at that. I have all the numbers. See that? I mean, all these numbers that I have, I know the mass of the Earth, I know G, and I know the radius of the Earth. When you plug in those numbers in there, it will turn out to be 11.2 um, uh, uh, kilometers per second, which is around 8 miles an hour. In other words, if I take the rocket or that golf ball and I throw it up in, I'm sorry, 8 miles per second. Uh, if I throw it up, sorry, 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 miles per second. Okay, if I take this golf ball or that rocket, assuming, of course, there is no atmosphere, there is no air drag, and if I would throw it up in the air, with a velocity of 8 miles per second, which is a very large velocity, that rocket is going to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. Of course, I can extend this idea and say, what is the gravitational, excuse me, what is the escape velocity of the Sun, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, you know, Pluto, whatever. Well, it's the same thing. It's the same formula, except that the mass of Jupiter divided by the radius of Jupiter, or the mass of the Sun divided by the radius of the Sun. So I can say the velocity of escape for, say, the Sun it's just going to be 2g mass of the sun divided by the radius of the sun under the square root, and so on. You get the idea? Okay, so it applies to everything here. That's why this problem is really cool. So now, you go back to the problem. The problem becomes trivial. I'm sure you can do it by yourself now. He said, a 1,000 kilogram rocket is fired straight up away from the surface of the Earth. What speed does the rocket need to escape from the gravitational pull of the Earth and never return? Assume an unrotating Earth. Of course, also assuming there is no air resistance, no air drag, none of that. Okay. So it turned out that it is basically all you need to do is use this formula, and you should get this answer right here, because the mass of the rocket doesn't really matter here. We should get that there. Now he, the way he solved it, he makes kind of a strange argument, different from mine. I make it through bound orbits. But he makes it in a different way. You can read his reasoning behind it. And there we go. We get the same answer. 11,200 11, meter per second or 11.2 uh, kilometer per second. Okay. Which is 25 miles per hour or 8 miles per second. You know, whatever. Whatever you want to use. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Good. 
Um, then there is a section called flat earth approximation. I'm not going to, you can read it. You're not going to see it on the homework. I think there is no problem on the homework or exam. Okay. Uh, it's kind of a cool, uh, 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 section and subject, you know, read about it. It's, it's very interesting, but I'm not going to be testing you on it at all. Okay. And then the next example is 13.3, uh, the one you're looking at right now. He says, <clears throat> A less than successful inventor, okay, so we have an inventor, wants to launch a small satellite, wants to launch small satellites into orbit by launching them straight up from the surface of the Earth at a very high speed. With what speed should he launch the satellite if it is to have a speed of 500 meter per second at a height of 400 kilometer? B, by what percentage would you answer, would your answer be in error if you use a flat earth approximation? I'm not going to do part B, I'm just going to do part A. All right, let, let me tell you what the story is. So I have here, oops, I want black color. Okay, so what I have, here is the earth. So this guy, he wants to launch a, uh, I think a rocket. Did he say a rocket? Satellite, sorry. So he wants to launch a satellite to turn to orbit in such a way that when he shoots this rocket up with some speed, God knows what, we're going to call it peanut. When he shoots it at the height of 400 um, kilometers, He wants the rocket to have a speed of, he gives you that speed, equals to, um, I don't know, I forgot, let me see. He says, wants to launch a small satellite into orbit by launching the, okay, with what speed, which is not should he launch the satellite if it is to have a speed of 500 meter per second at 400, okay? So here we have 500 here. He's asking, with what speed should he launch the, the satellite or the rocket in order at the height of 400 kilometers, which is about what, um, I don't know, 250 miles or something, uh, kilometers, the speed of the rocket or the satellite is uh, 500. So what would be that speed? Again, we just use conservation of energy. That's it, really. You can't solve it. That's the best, easiest way to do it. So you basically ask the question, what is the total energy here? And what's the total energy here? Make them equal. You're done. You see what I'm saying? So let's start here at the bottom. So what's the total energy here? Well, at the bottom, let me just write down. Example 13.3. So what's going on here? Well, at the bottom right here, right on the surface, that is. Uh, so we have uh, one half m v naught squared uh, minus g mass of the satellite, I'm going to call it m, okay, mass of the earth divided by radius of the earth, makes sense? Because the, uh, the, the dimension of the rocket is really tiny compared to the radius of the earth, right? Okay, there we go. So this is basically the total energy right before we launch it, right here. You got it? Make sense? Okay. Now, here, at this height, at 400 kilometers, well, the rocket is still moving, so it has kinetic, different from this kinetic right here. So, in this case, I'm going to have 1 half mv squared minus gmm earth over what? Over radius of the earth plus 400 kilometers. Make sense? I mean, I'll fix the unit in a second. I wanted to pause the video and think about that if you don't get it. But that's basically the equation. I'm done with the problem. Once I get that, I'm done. I have pretty much everything that I need. All I need is just to solve for that, and I'm done with the problem. Now, before I do that, I can eliminate the... Uh, oops, this one here. 
I can eliminate the mass of the satellite. See that? M, 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 M cancel out. And then all I need to do is to solve for V naught. You see what I'm saying? Just do the algebra. You solve for V naught. And when you do that, I'm going to... And then, of course, this 400 kilometers is 4 times 10 to the 5th meters. You see what I'm saying? Then you want to add it to the radius of the Earth, which you already know what it is. 6 million, 6.37 times 10 to the 6. Then you add them up together to get that. And then you move this to the other side and so on. So anyway, you will end up with this. Uh, let me write it down here. So V naught will be V naught squared will be equal V squared minus 2G mass of the Earth bracket 1 over R Earth plus 4 times 10 to the 5th plus 1 over R Earth. And then that's it. You just plug in everything and you'll get V naught to be equal to 2,770 meters per second. You got it? Okay. Okay, good. Um, the next topic is uh, satellite orbits. Okay, um, so let's take the, the case where a picture, say you have a satellite going around the Earth, for example. So here is the satellite orbit. Here is the satellite right there. Okay, and then this is the Earth right here. Of course, realistically, it doesn't look like that. Um, a more realistic one, here is the Earth and here is the satellite, right? They are so close to the Earth, okay? You can't even see the other side or something. I mean, it's, but anyway, that just will take it this way. And of course, this is the, uh, the distance between the uh, satellite and the Earth. The Earth is here. And this is the velocity of the satellite around, okay? Now, if we assume circular orbit, and this is important to consider. It's a good approximation. All orbits in the celestial world, in the in the, in the universe, uh, celestial mechanics are considered uh, uh, elliptical. Okay. However, their eccentricity is very close to zero, which means they're almost uh, circular. Okay. So we'll. Uh, so it, it is a, a decent approximation. It's a good approximation. Uh, the error is probably one percent or maybe even less than one percent. So it is a good approximation to assume it's a circular orbit, but it, all orbits out there are really uh, elliptical. Okay, so anyway, so um, so we have here the force between them, basically the gravitational force, F, and it's, of course, F, whatever the kind of force we deal with, is always equal to MA, the kinetic reaction. And this A is the centripetal acceleration, because it's going around in a circle, as you can see, right? So in this case, the force F is equal to m v squared over r, being r being, of course, the distance between the Earth and uh, and the satellite, or you know, the Moon and the satellite, or the whatever, right? Okay, and this F here is the gravitational force. So we have g mass of the satellite, mass of the Earth. For our case, the Earth could be something else, divided by the distance between them squared equals to mv squared over r. Well, that's kind of a cool equation. Let's eliminate the mass of the satellite. In other words, the mass of the satellite does not matter. Only the mass of the Earth matters. And the, this r and the squared cancel out. I end up with an interesting velocity equal to uh, big G, big M, the mass of the orbiting by uh, the, uh, the, the parent or whatever you call it, the Earth, divided by r under the root, okay? And that's, again, another important equation. This is the velocity of an orbiting object going in circle 
and, cir uh, and circle or underline the word circle. This is important. Not an ellipse. If it's ellipse, it's much more complicated. You need uh, <clears throat> a more advanced course. If you take a course with me in classical mechanics, I teach that course once in a while, and we go over that if it's not in a circular order. It becomes pretty complicated. But anyway, this is just in circle. You get that? Okay. Why do I say that? Well, let me show you. Go back to the conservation of... Uh, first of all, write down this equation, because we're going to need it in a minute. Or maybe, uh, you know, just square both sides, just leave it like that. Uh, let's just say the mass of any object here. I'm just going to make it general in case, okay? And I'll come back to it. Just make it. Okay. So, we said that the total energy of an object is K minus U, correct? Okay. So, for circular object, for circular orbit, um, in this case, we have E equals to 1 half MV squared minus GM, uh, shall we call it M, M prime over the distance R. Is that okay? Okay. Let's make this M prime. I'm trying to get rid of that M prime. Let's make it M prime here. Okay. But V squared is equal to this one right here. There it is. Because I'm not using my hand, it drops pretty uh, a lot. Anyway, there it is right here. So V squared is equal to GM over R. I'm going to plug it in. So that's E is equal to 1 half M big G big, uh, big M over R minus GM. Uh, this is M prime here, sorry. Uh, M, M prime over R. Now, look at that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm making, a, I'm, I'm confusing things here. Hold on, I'm sorry. V squared, v, this M and this M are the same, correct? I hope you understand that, right? Okay. So maybe just keep it M here. Well, let me clean it up a little bit. So, in this case, I'll have one half G, M, M prime over R minus g m m prime <coughs> over r what does that mean it mean i mean if i add them up together you're gonna end up you'll end up with one half g m m prime over r isn't that interesting so what does that mean it means for circular orbit look at that what is this this is the original potential energy right here. See that? For circular orbit, the total energy E, this one, is basically negative half U. Isn't that interesting? And the kinetic energy, here is the kinetic energy. Remember we plugged in the value of the kinetic energy here? And it's basically equal to, here's the kinetic energy right here. It's also equal to half U. Okay. Now, I want you to keep those in mind, okay, because there is a homework, at least a couple of homework problems that where you use circular orbit. When you read the word circular orbit, this should come to your mind, okay? Kind of an interesting relationship. That's all I'm saying for now. Okay. Uh, I have two more topics I want to talk about before we start doing problems. The next one is uh, I want to show you, I promised you I want to show you Kepler's third law. If you look up, go back to Kepler's third law, he basically says the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the distance. Okay, what does that mean? Here is, um, here is the, uh, let's say what, uh, let's say the earth around the sun, or whatever. Here is the earth right here, here is the sun, 
here's a distance. Assume it's a circular orbit, or you know, ignore the fact it's uh, elliptical. And so the Earth is going around. It takes the Earth a period of 365 approximately days to make one circle around the Sun. Correct? Okay. And here is the average radius of the of the Earth. Right? It basically says the square of the period, the time it takes the Earth to complete one circle, is proportional to the cube of the radius. Okay? If, if it's still vague for you, it's okay. I'm going to derive that for you and show you how that works. I'm going to derive it for you using Newtonian physics, not Kepler. Here is how it works. Again, suppose we have circular orbit. Why circle? Because it's simple. So what I have in here, again, let's go back to this picture right here. Now, you agree with me that the velocity of this object is basically equal to the circumference of the circle divided by the period. Make sense? You know, the distance it takes, uh, excuse me, the time it takes to, uh, the time it takes to complete one circle is the period. And that distance is the circumference. So I'm going to write this down right here. Just keep it on the side. We also said that um, from the previous page, here it is, for circular orbit, there is another expression for velocity, if you remember. It's this one right here. See that? Make sense? Here, I also wrote there, velocity of an orbiting object is this, for any object, not just Earth. So now I can just square both sides and get this. That's basically what it is. Okay, so this is another expression that I'm going to use here. So, and it's equal to um, big G M over R, where M is the mass of the being, you know, the object that is being orbited about. Uh, and that's to the square root. There we go. So those two relationships must be equal. This one comes from basic uh, mechanics. And that's come from uh, our derivation there. So now if I would equate them together. So um, I have here 2 pi r over tau equals square root of g big M over r. Well, I want to get rid of this uh, square root, so square both sides. Then we're going to get 4 pi, r, 4 pi squared, excuse me, r squared over tau squared equals to gm over r, right? And let me solve for tau. So if I solve for tau squared, basically, well, let's let's cross multiply. I, I don't want to skip too many steps. Let's cross multiply. So that's going to be uh, tau squared times g big M equals to cross multiply going to be 4 pi squared r cubed, and therefore tau squared equals to 4 pi squared over big G m r cubed. Notice that this is a constant. Make sense? Is that a constant? 4 pi g, and m is the mass of the earth, or mass of whatever. So this whole thing is a constant, and notice that this is tau squared, and this is r, uh, r cubed, sorry, so, as you can see, tau squared is proportional to r cubed, which what Kepler's third law claimed right there. See what I'm saying? So, this is a famous equation. As a matter of fact, I have, uh, I have heard that from a NASA scientist, uh, one of my friends. He works in uh, Goddard Space Lab in uh, Maryland. And uh, in rocket, uh, forgot the name of his department, something like uh, propulsion or something. And uh, he said, we do not use Newtonian physics. We mainly use this formula for launching rocket. They still use it. It's a Keplerian formula for Kepler. And this is the, this is the equation that they use to help them calculate uh, how they you know, launch rockets and so on. Pretty interesting. Anyway, OK. And the last topic before we start doing problems is uh, the, what is known as the geosynchronous orbit or geosynchronous uh, motion.
geosynchronous. Geosynchronous, okay? Um, the first person to actually propose uh, geosynchronous orbit was um, Arthur C. Clarke, the famous science fiction writer. If you read science fiction, you're probably familiar with his name, Arthur C. Arthur C. Clarke, in uh, something in the 19, late 1940s or something like that. He proposed that. Uh, anyway, what uh, what is a geosynchronous orbit? Uh, think about a a communication satellite. Uh, that stays on one spot above the Earth, okay? In other words, if you're able to see it with your naked eye, you see it right there all the time. It doesn't move, okay? It's always on one spot of the Earth and above the equator, okay? We want to simplify things. Otherwise, it will become really complicated. So it is above one spot, one spot. For some reason, the band is not working good. Above one spot uh, and above, above equator. Okay. So, what is the period of such satellite? Well, the period is going to be just twenty-four hours. Makes sense. I mean, in other words, it's going if it's if it insists it's going staying on the same spot. It's going to be 24 hours, which is um, 8, 6, 4, 0, 0 seconds. So that's the period of that satellite, okay? Um, so it will look something like that. So here is the, uh, here is the, uh, the, uh, the object that is in, in uh, geosynchronous orbit. Here it is, right here. And here is the Earth. And it is always on this spot of the Earth, specifically. It's always. So, in other words, the period of this uh, or uh, the period of the satellite is 24 hours. And we are interested in finding what is that velocity, or maybe how far is it? How far should it be from Earth? You see what I'm saying? Okay. How do we do it? Well, what is the what is the the height r here? Well, it's basically, uh, if we assume the, uh, the radius uh, of the satellite is really tiny compared to the dimension of the Earth, so it's basically the height above the surface of the Earth plus the radius of the Earth. Make sense? That's basically what this R is. Remember, this height is basically from the surface to the orbit. That's height. And then you have this which is r, radius of the Earth. So the total r, total distance, is to that, is basically height plus size. I hope you get that. Okay. So I can call it r geo is equal to the height plus the radius of the Earth. Um, suppose that I'm interested in finding uh, what, what I want to do is I want to use Kepler's third, third law, and I want to find the how high is it, okay? So I have this formula right here. Let me write it down for you again here. It basically says tau squared equals to 4 pi squared over gm r cubed. 4 pi squared over gm r cubed. I am interested in finding an expression, or basically I want to find how far is it from the Earth in order for it to be in a geosynchronous orbit. Okay, let's start with that. So r in this case is equal, remember I'm solving for r here. In this case, r in this case is going to be equal to gm over 4 pi squared tau squared to the one-third. Make sense? And this R here, let me write it in, in a better way, R geo. Okay? So, 
what that means, I can just plug in those numbers. So G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times the mass, which is for our case, we're talking about geosynchronous, so that would be the mass of the Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the, to the power of 24 divided by 4 pi r squared and times the period and the period is equal to what 24 hours which is uh, 8 6 400 squared uh, did I miss anything there we go and then you calculate all of that to the one-third you can pause the video and calculate it yourself if you want here is the answer you're gonna get 4.225 times 10 to the power of 7 meters well, how big is that in terms of mile or something? Well, let's see. Remember, we said that R geo is what is equal to the height plus the radius of the Earth, okay? I want to know how high is it above the surface of the Earth, okay? This is what I'm interested in. So let me go, in other words, go back to the picture. Put a different color. Go back to the picture. I am interested in the height. How high is it from the surface of the Earth? Oops from the surface of the Earth all the way to the satellite. I'm not interested in the radius, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm basically interested in the R, in H. I want to reduce, I want to subtract the radius of the Earth. You got that? Okay. Because this includes it. So therefore, height in this case is going to be equal to R geo minus the radius of the Earth. Simple. So you have 4.225 times 10 to the 7th minus the radius of the Earth, 6.37 times 10 to the 6. And when you calculate that, you'll end up with the following, 3.59 times 10 to the 7 meters, which is roughly 36, uh, 35,900 kilometers which is 2,200 miles, which is really a lot, 22,000 miles, okay? I'm not even aware if there are any geosync satellites at that such distance. The distance is very, very vast, okay? Most satellites that we know of are, uh, they call them uh, low Earth orbits, okay? They're much, much lower than that, something in the order of, um, I believe, something like uh, 300, 400, something like that. Uh, kilometers, uh, not this high, you know, uh, uh, you know, 35, almost 36,000 kilometers or 22,000, that's just too high, okay? Most orbits are not in that high, so most orbits are around in the region of 300 or 400 kilometers. Okay, anyway, so that's basically an, an exercise, there we go. So this is a what it, what it means to have a geosynchronous orbit. So what's so special about geosynchronous orbit? Uh, it's a communication satellite, maybe? It is above one spot, which makes it has a the period of 24 hours, and it is above the equator, okay, most of the time. It becomes just the more complicated if it's not above the equator. And um, and then if we are interested in finding what is, how far is it, so we, this is what we've done. Now, you can work it out and find what is the speed of such satellite. You can do that. I'm not going to do it here, but you can do it if you're interested. Okay, I mean, I would imagine it would be extremely fast in order for it to catch up with the Earth to make, you know, to make this huge orbit uh, in, in 24 hours. So you can imagine it's going to go really fast, you know what I'm saying? Okay, and that's about it. So let me, uh, I have a, um, let's see, um, yeah, let me do some problems from the homework. Uh, and I have marked the specific ones. I'm going to do one, two... I thought that is a third. Uh, three, 50. I'm going to do number 22, 44, and 53 or 57. I forgot which one. I don't have it marked. I know I have one of them. Sorry. 50. Oh, 53 is a little bit easy. Maybe I'll do both. How about that? Okay, so 22, 44, 53, 57. Okay. Let's begin. Hmm. 
number 22. Okay, it says, oh, let me take it to the book. That would be a good idea. Chapter 13. Number 22. Right there, okay. Um, let me move it out of the screen. Okay, this is the problem right here, 22, and it says two meteorites, meteoroids are heading for Earth. Okay, so we have two rocks heading for Earth. Their speed as they cross the moon's orbit, as they cross the moon's orbit, are two kilometers per second. Both have the same speed, two kilometers per second. Okay. He said the first rock, the first meteoroid, is heading straight for Earth. What is its speed of impact? Got it? Second one, he said the second misses the Earth by 5,000 kilometers. What is its speed at its closest point? Okay? It can be a hard problem, but they're not bad, especially if you would draw a free body diagram. So let me, let me take the first case. Again, first thing I really I want to put in what are the, uh, the data here. So we have the two, the velocity of both is uh, two kilomet kilometers. I'm sorry, I'm not doing well in terms of handwriting. And two meteorites. Okay, so let's take the first case. So the first case says the the first meteorite is heading straight for Earth. Now, where is the meteorite? Well, here is the moon's orbit. Now, I don't care about the moon. He just said the moon orbit. So here is the moon orbit right here. Okay. Here is the Earth right here. Okay. And let's assume that the meteorite is right here and it is heading toward the Earth with a speed, let me call that speed V naught. Okay. He's asking, what is the speed here? Let me make that circle, the Earth, a little bit bigger because I want to consider its radius. You can't ignore the radius of the Earth. Okay? And remember, this, the, how far is it from the Moon? Excuse me, from, from the Earth? It's basically the Moon distance. This is what he says. So I can go back to the table and write it down here. What is the distance between the Earth and the Moon? It turned out to be, if you look up the table, I have it in my note here, it is 3.84 times 10 to the power of 8 meters. Okay? This is the number that you need to know. You need to look up. Okay. So, again, it's just conservation of energy, right? So, basically, ask the question, what is the total energy here? And what is the total energy here? So, the speed of impact right of the surface right there, right? So, what is the total energy of both? Quite them together. Solve. Done. Simple. Okay. Let's do it. So, let's call this position 1 and let's call that position 2. So for position one, it's going to be one half m, the mass of the meteorite, v1 squared, minus g, mass of the Earth, mass of the meteorite. Let's make it capital for Earth. How about that? Okay. Divided by how far is it? Well, it's the distance from the moon, Earth and the moon, right? This is position one. This must be equal to position two right here where it is equal to one half m v2 moon, correct? Minus g mass of the uh, meteorite, mass of the earth. I'll just put it, or sorry, let me just put it here. I don't want to confuse anybody. And this is the mass of the earth divided by what? Well, divided by just the radius of the earth. Makes sense? Because he is right there. It is right there on the surface. So the only distance to the center is really just the, uh, the radius of the earth. That's it. You're done with the problem. All you need to do now, you solve for V2. Remember, V1 here is basically V0, correct? Right here. That's V0 here. Is that right? Let me do it again with the mouse. V0 here, V1, is basically V0. Okay? And then the, all I need to do now is just do the math and solve for V2. 
you can first, you know, reduce the mass of the retiorite is not important. Maybe that's why you didn't give it to us. And then you just work out the algebra and then you find V2. Okay. And when you do it, you work it out and you'll end up with 11 kilometer per second. Kilometer. Don't, don't forget, it's not a meter. Kilometer. That's at least my answer. Got it? Okay. Now we're going to do the same thing, but, for, sorry, different. Uh, part part B now is a little bit different. Look what he says. The second misses the Earth by five thousand by five thousand kilometers. What is the speed of the closest point? So here is a picture. Let me show you the picture how it looks like. So here is the orbit. Okay, and initially just the same as this one here, it was in position one right here. Here it is. Here is position one. Here is the rock. Here is the Earth. Okay? And with the radius, Earth radius. So here position one, and it's going toward the Earth. But here is what happened. It didn't go toward the Earth directly. It went like that. See what I'm saying? So that's the closest point right here. So here position one, and that's position two. And of course position one, the radius is just the radius from the from position one to the Earth, which is basically the the distance to the, uh, the the distance between the Earth and the Moon. However, here is four thousand. So this one, uh, four thousand or five thousand, it is uh, five thousand, I think. Five thousand. So here the distance is five thousand uh, kilometer. Okay. Remember the velocity here is what uh, I forgot it again. Two kilometers per second. That would be like V naught, if you will. Now he wants to know what is the velocity here, okay? Whichever direction. You got it. So it's really the same thing, except that this is the situation. So I'm just going to set it up exactly the same way. So it's going to be one half m v one squared. This is position one. Remember, g m uh, meteorite m Earth over uh, the distance, which is r to the moon and the Earth equals to uh, one half m two v two squared minus g m m uh, earth over what over the radius of the earth plus five thousand which is five times ten to the power of uh, what is it eight and then you work it out for for v two you know you're gonna the masses cancel out. This is mass. Just this mass m. The masses cancel out. You work it out, and then you get v two. And I got an answer of eight point nine kilometer per second. Per, yes, per second. And there we go. Understand that, everyone? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Let's do one more. Number. Number 44, I think I said 45, didn't I? Okay. So here we have number 44. Oh. Back to the book. There we go. It says an unexplored planet, Alpha Centauri 3, has a radius of 7 times 10 to the 6 meters. Okay, so this is the uh, unexplored planet, you know, something like an exoplanet, has a radius of 7 times 10 to the 6 meters, a little bit larger than the Earth. Remember, the Earth is 6 times 6.37. So this one a little bit larger. A visiting astronaut drops a rock from rest into a 100 meter deep crevice. She records that it takes six seconds for the rock to reach the bottom. What is the mass of the Alpha Centauri? Okay, isn't that interesting? I mean, uh, imagine that I put you, I mean, well, let's say we are on Earth, okay? And somebody is interested in knowing the mass of the Earth. 
I can tell you that I can know the mass of the Earth if I drop a golf ball from, uh, say, one meter height, and I measure how long it will take. From this information, I can tell you what the mass of the planet is. Isn't that fascinating, how physics is fascinating? That's basically the story, okay? So let me draw the picture for you. So it looks something like that. So here is the surface of the planet, and then you get that crevice, the hole. It looks something like that. And here is the astronaut. Make him look like an astronaut. Make her look like an astronaut. That's like a helmet, you know what I mean? Hey, pretty cool astronaut. There we go. Nice. Nice. All right. So, here's the rock. And then you throw it in the hole, ditch, whatever you want to call it. Of course, the initial velocity here is zero, right? He said Alpha Centauri, the radius of Alpha Centauri is 7 times 10 to the 6 meters. It's given to us. It says that the time it takes it to reach the bottom right here, this uh, little rock here, it takes it um, 6 seconds. What is the mass of Alpha Centauri? Okay. Well, easy or not easy? Well, I can find G, remember? I mean, let's go back to free fall kinematics. And it's going to be on the exam, so make sure that you learn free fall kinematics on the final exam. That is, so I'm going to take number uh, uh, number two. No, sorry, number three. Number three says uh, y equals v naught t minus one half g t squared. Okay. Of course, v naught is zero because the initial velocity. Look over there, zero. So in this case. I can find, ignore the minus sign, maybe if you want to ignore that minus sign, because the, the height here would be minus. But anyway, so I can write it this way. And I have the time already. I can find G. I don't know the, the G on the planet. I need to find G. Um, and he gives me the, this, the radius. Um, uh, I don't know the... Hold on, hold on. So we have here 2Y over t squared. Is that okay? All right. Do I know the height? Yes, I do. Right here. So in this case, I can, uh, we can say that 2 times 100 over the time, which is 6 squared. You follow me, everybody? So we have here g. I can calculate that. Let me use my calculator. When I find it, right here, go ahead and calculate that for me. So I have uh, 200 divided by 36. Answer 5.55. So we have G value of this planet is 5.56 meter per second squared. Our Earth is 9.8, as you know. But Alpha Centauri is 5.56. Okay? Now, why do I want this? Well, he wants the mass. Go back to the first 10 minutes of the lecture we talked about the value of g remember we said that here let me let me review again go back to the first page or so of this lecture we said m the weight is also equal to g m m over r squared so m will cancel out so the g value is equal to um, big g mass of the earth or the planet alpha <clears throat> over the radius of alpha squared. See that? I already know what G is. It's right here. You see what I'm going to that? Pretty simple problem. So M alpha, it becomes G R radius alpha over big G. And then you just plug in the numbers. So it becomes uh, 5.56 times uh, the radius of alpha centauri is Oops, I should have put a big R here. But anyway, I should make it big R, sorry. Uh, 7 times 10 to the 6 squared divided by 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Calculate that. And then the mass that I got, 
times 10 to the 24th kilogram. There we go. I got the mass of a planet. Got it? Okay. Next uh, number. Oh, yes. Number 53. I don't know why it's level 3. He puts it level 3. I don't know why. And it's only really one step. Okay, number 53. Right there. Uh, he said, how much energy would be required to move the Earth into circular orbit with a radius of one kilometer larger than its current radius? Okay. And when you get the number, it's an enormous amount, okay? What I'm going to do, I'm just going to give you a sketch on how to solve it. It's pretty simple. But I'm going to solve it in the following way. Look at this. I'm going to reread this one in a different way. How much energy would it be required to move the Earth into a circular orbit with a radius of D larger than its current radius? D. So it doesn't have to be one kilometer. It could be uh, two kilometers or half a kilometer or 20 kilometers, whatever it is, okay? So I'm just going to give you the general equation for that, and then we we want to calculate the uh, the energy required, okay? In other words, let me show you a picture. Again, a picture is always worth a thousand words. Uh, you need to be able to see how the picture looks like. So basically, here is the... Uh, or is or sun, the sun, right? Uh, yeah. So let's assume that the. I'm sorry. One second. One second. I am required to move. Yeah, they are. Okay. Uh, so let's assume that here is the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Okay. Here is the Sun right here. Again, he says emphasize the word. It's very important. He says circular orbit. This is very important. Circular orbit is very, very important. I'll show you in a minute why. Maybe that's why it's level 3, because of this word. Okay. So anyway, so here is the Earth right here. And it's going around the Earth, excuse me, the Sun in a circular orbit. And that's the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So what I want to do, the question is, if I am, if I can take this Earth right here, and move it a distance d above or below. Maybe just still make it above. Again, this is highly exaggerated. It shouldn't be noticeable that much. But anyway, so I want to move it here now. How much energy would that be required? Okay. Well, we said that in circular orbit, The energy is equal to what? Half u. Forget about the minus sign. We're just talking about the absolute value here. Half u, correct? So, as a matter of fact, it's actually, for such a case, it would be uh, half delta u. In other words, the energy required would be basically, what is the potential energy here? What is the potential energy here? And the difference between them, okay? The difference, so what is the potential energy here? What's the potential energy here? The difference between them should be basically equal to the energy that you need to input into the orbit to move the Earth from this location to this location. See what I'm saying? So basically, it would be something like that. The energy required would be uh, one half u final minus u initial, where this is final and this is initial. Okay? And that's it. So in this case, we will have something like one half, uh, what is u final? G m earth m sun over what? The distance between the earth and the sun plus that d. Remember that distance d minus the difference uh, g mass earth mass sun over the, di the the original distance mass earth sun and there we go we're done that's it it's really that simple 
All you need now is to plug in whatever number. Now he says, calculate it for one kilometer right there, right? So you can calculate for one kilometer, but you have a problem. You know what the problem is? Is that if you take the mass, everybody see the problem? Anybody can see the problem here? I'll give you just five, ten seconds to think about it before I tell you what it is. Okay, look at this. This is the radius of the Earth, right? Radius of the Earth is 6.37 times 10 to the uh, to the 6. And then this one is just 10 to the 3rd meter. Okay, this is of course the same number as that. In other words, when you add this plus this, unless you have a really accurate calculator, you want to use all the digits in that calculator, otherwise you're, not going, to, you're going to get basically a zero here, the difference between them, because they'll be so close to each other. Okay. Uh, so another way of doing it is you can use approximation, uh, and I'm not going to go through it. Here is, here is how it works. You can, if, again, you use your calculator with all the digits in there to plug it in. Uh, first of all, before before I do that, let me just show you. Let me give you one more step. Uh, one one more step to this one. Uh, it will be something like that. One over radius sun earth plus D minus 1 over uh, Sun Earth like that, right? And then you plug in your numbers here. Okay, you can ignore that for now. Okay, we, the, I mean, uh, the, the problem is getting this to be not zero. So you want to use all the digits that you, are, you have available in, 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 in your calculator to do it. Another way to do it, again, uh, you can use the following approximation. I have done it already for you, so you can just plug it in. Uh, it turned out that it's also equivalent to this. This E, I'm starting from here, okay? I'm starting from here with this approximation. E is equal to one half G mass Earth, mass Sun, D over Earth, Sun squared. Don't expect a problem like this on my exam. Okay, I promise you. This is a not. Uh, this it's 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 a long problem. It's not a difficult problem. But it's a long problem. Anyway, you can work it out this way. So you this d here, you replace it with ten to the third meter, and then you put that, and they should give you an answer. And the answer that I got, one point eight times ten to the twenty five joule. Okay. I guess it's a hard problem. I didn't think about it hard. Now that I that I explain it, I can see the difficulty of it, I guess. Okay. <clears throat> the last problem that I want to do is number 57. Kind of a cool problem. Okay. There's a picture associated with it. Right here, this picture, let me make it bigger. Okay, so he says, uh, the figure shows two planets of mass M orbiting a star of mass big M. Okay, so you got the star right here, and you got those two binary systems moving around. The planets are in the same orbit with radius r, but are always opposite ends of a diameter. Okay? Find an exact expression for the period. Now, that's a toughy one. I agree. That's kind of a toughy problem. Uh, so, how do we solve this problem? Let me show you. Let me draw it first. So, here is the big circle. Perfect. All right, and here is the diameter. Here is the sun, uh, the star, whatever it is. Then you have one planet here. They're both identical. Okay, so let's say they're moving this way. The distance here is R, R, M, M, 
big M, right? Okay. So he said find uh, an expression for the period. Well, let me refresh your memory. How do I find an expression for the period? Let's go back to the circular orbit of the Earth around the Sun, for example. Here, whoops, here is the R right here. Here's the Sun, big M, small m. So how do I find it? Well, we know that the velocity is 2 pi r over the period, right? And we know that the velocity, uh, let, me, let me derive it again, uh, g m m over r squared equals m v squared over r. Now, don't ask me how you got that. We did it already. Go back to the beginning of the lecture. We did this uh, problem already. So the velocity in this case would be equal to square root of g m over r. I can take this baby right here and put it right there, equate it together. So I have here, oops, I have um, square root of g m over r equals to, I'm equating it with that, right? So here is v, which is right here. And then I'm going to equate it with this. So that's going to be, <coughs> excuse me, 2 pi r over tau, and then from there I can get the value of tau, which is Kepler's third law, basically, correct? So it becomes 4 pi squared r squared over tau squared equals g m over r. Then you work it out. You see what I'm saying? So tau, in this case, tau squared, that is, is equal to, uh, how do I do that? Uh, 4 pi squared over g m r cubed. There it is. Okay? I'm going to do, if I know that, if I know how to do that, I can do this one. The only difference is that I have two masses rather than one. So I'm going to do exactly the same process that I have just done. But this time I'm going to do it with two masses. Watch how I do it. So sum of the forces equals ma. You always begin with that, right? So it becomes here. Let's look at the forces. I have two forces here. You have, let's say, this mass here, okay? Uh, this mass here, this mass, it's being attracted by the star and the, that other mass. So in this case, it's going to be G, let's talk the star first. G, mass of the star, mass of the mass, whatever it is, over R squared, plus, from the star down, mass of G, mass squared, over what? 2R quantity squared. Yes? See, this is have the same mass, so it's going to be m squared. And the distance from here to here is 2r. This expression is basically between the star big M and this one. Got it? All of that is equal to what? Is equal to m. A here is what? V squared over r, the radius of the orbit. Remember, the mass goes around this radius. Okay. Once you get there, really, you're pretty much done. Now, what is the velocity v? Well, the velocity v is nothing but the the circumference divided by the period, right here. So the v here becomes two pi r over the period. He's interested in the period, so I'm going to plug it in right there, uh, and then you work it out. You're really done with the problem. You work it out. I don't. I mean, I can move. You know, I can show you more steps, but it's just algebra, simple. You know, simple algebra. Plug it in here. So with this here, I'm going to get something like that. Uh, G M. Take for example, uh, uh, G M big M here. Sorry, big M over R squared. Um, hold on. Hold I'm trying to do my algebra correct. Okay, I'm trying to work fast, but I don't want to work fast. Let me let me let, let me uh, let me plug in this v in here. Okay, so it's going to be g m m r squared plus g m squared over four r squared equals to m uh, four pi squared r squared over tau squared. Correct? See that? And then when you work it out, if you really work it out, you're going to end up with this. You can do the algebra. It's a simple algebra. I end up with this. I'm just going to write it from my note here. 4 pi squared r cubed over big G 
times 1 over big M plus small m over 4. All of that to the square root, 1 half. And then you plug in the numbers that he gives you. Um, I'm sorry, he didn't give us any numbers. You just basically, you, you, can, you, you can stop right here and that'll be the end of it. I went one step further and my final answer looks like this. 16 pi squared r cubed over g parenthesis 4 big M small m. Again, whichever answer is probably correct. And there we go. We have that. Got it? Okay, I think I'm going to stop here. I have done enough uh, problems for you to do the rest of them. And let me know if you have any other problems. You can just, uh, you know, post it under Ask the Professor, and I'll try to help you out with it, okay? I'll hit. Okay, uh, have a good week. Bye-bye.